Coming up on this week's edition of NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. NCBA's efforts in Washington, D.C. help to protect the business climate for cattlemen and women all across our country. We're in our nation's capital to learn more about how NCBA works for you. And now, from Washington, D.C., it's NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. Hello and welcome. I'm Kevin Auctioner. When we asked producers about the value of the National Cattlemen's Beef Association, one of the first answers they give is how the organization provides a strong voice right here in Washington, D.C. on behalf of the cattle industry. That's why we're coming to you from our nation's capital to give you some insights into the work being done here each and every day, whether it's on Capitol Hill, the EPA, or even in the White House. And joining us now is Jerry Bone, the chair of NCBA's policy division. Jerry, thanks for coming to Washington, D.C. and being on the show today. Thanks for having me, Kevin. It's good to be here. So why is it important for NCBA to have a presence, an actual office here in our nation's capital? Well, it's important that the beef and cattle industry have a voice here. And I think our members and those who are not even members but are participants in our industry need to understand that we have a team here that has boots on the ground every day. And they're working on building relationships with congressmen and their staffs, Congress, members of Congress and their staff, um, the people who work in all of the regulatory agencies that influence our industry. And it's important that they understand that we're pushing the uh, rural way, rural viewpoint of life, you know, and how things should be in our business. And uh, we're dealing with an increasingly urban focused Congress and regulatory government. And so it's important that that rural focus and rural viewpoint gets expressed. And NCBA is doing that every single day. It's fantastic. And you mentioned boots on the ground. Um, is there any accomplishment or accomplishments during this last Congress that you would say may not have happened if we did not have actual boots on the ground here in D.C.? I think we had several wins. Uh, one, the first one that comes to mind is the tax reform bill that got passed early this year. While we didn't get every single thing that we would have liked in that bill, there were several things there that would be certainly beneficial to the beef industry and agriculture in general. I think also uh, there was a CERCLA law that was uh, being promulgated that would have required agricultural operations to report animal waste as hazardous waste. And it was never the intent of Congress or the law to call animal waste hazardous. And so we were able to stop that and get that repealed. Uh, we've been working on uh, with the Department of Transportation to get the uh, electronic logging devices and hours of service rule uh, fixed to better help our trucking partners uh, get animals transported across the country in a humane way. Mm -hmm. We were able to get a one-year extension on that and we're continuing to work with that department to try to come up with a permanent solution. I think finally uh, we had several wins in the trade area. I think it's exciting that we got a Korea, South Korea free trade agreement approved and they're certainly one of our largest beef customers today and we recently got a, the US MCA rule or trade agreement approved. That's a, the agreement that replaces NAFTA between the U.S., Canada, and Mexico. And so right. those are certainly things that we can hang our hat on and that we're proud of. And NCBA was heavily involved in, in the, uh, the accomplishments of getting each of those uh, done. Those are some impressive accomplishments, but there's one thing we have yet to do. That's the Farm Bill. I know that uh, many members of our staff are working hard on the Farm Bill uh, during this lame duck session. Um, what are some of the components that our staff is trying to make certain are included in this version of the Farm Bill? Well, first of all, we're hopeful that we'll get it passed yet here during this lame duck session of Congress. And certainly with the change that's gone on here uh, in the recent election, uh, some of the things that we would hope could have gotten done may not get in there. But uh, I think it's still important to note that the inclusion of a foot and mouth disease vaccine bank is in the bill. We're hoping that that will st get to stay in the bill and that some funding will be put in there so that we, we can begin to populate that vaccine base in case that we would ever have an, and hopefully never, but have a, if that we're prepared if we have an outbreak of foot and mouth disease here in the country. There's some uh, conservation titles that are in the bill that are certainly beneficial to us. And I think it's important to point out too that there's a couple of things that did not get included in the bill that we consider pretty onerous. And that's the mandatory country of origin labeling mm -hmm. that we've been dealing with for several years as well as the GYPSA rule that has been pretty contentious and it thankfully neither one of those are included in the current farm bill. 
One last question, Jerry. How can cattlemen and women all across the country support NCBA's efforts here in Washington, D.C.? Well, I think first of all is that they need to become a member and uh, be help us grow the team. Uh, the more members we have, the stronger our voice is here. Uh, and I think, too, they need to understand that NCBA is working on a very wide range of, uh, of issues that influence and have an effect on agriculture and the beef industry particularly. I was privileged yesterday morning to be able to sit in on a, a staff meeting of the Washington, D.C. team, and it amazed me the wide array of uh, different uh, activities and different legislation that they're dealing with and working on all on behalf of the industry. And so join NCBA. Uh, Contribute to our PAC, help us, uh, help us get the right people here, and finally vote for the right people here that will come and help support our industry. I second that motion. Thanks for coming to the show, Jerry. All right, good to have us. Th thanks for having me. You bet. You can help NCBA fight for common sense federal policies and against efforts that threaten our future of our beef cattle industry by becoming a member of NCBA. When you join, you'll receive the Members Only Beltway Beef Newsletter, a weekly update straight from Washington, D.C. that gives you the latest information on the key policy initiatives that will impact your business. It's easy to become a member. Just call 1-866-233-3872 or you can visit the website joinncba.org. As you're no doubt aware, a lot happens on Capitol Hill as Congress works on a variety of issues. We sent Cattlemen to Cattlemen reporter Kate Maher to the Hill to talk with those directly involved in the decision-making process. Kate? Thanks, Kevin. We're here today with Congressman Doug LaMalfa from Northern California. Congressman, thank you for taking some time out of your day to visit with us. Happy to. Thank you. Um, so there's a little concern in rural America that we don't have a farm bill yet. What's the outlook on getting a farm bill done in this Congress? Well, as you know, each, each House passed a version of it. It's in the conference committee here. I'm really hoping and pushing we can get this cranked out in the next six weeks so we don't have the delay of going into new Congress and having to start, well, maybe not quite from scratch, but certainly start a new process all over again. You're going to have a, the Congress have a different makeup with many new members in the House and some new senators as well. So let's just get the job done. And so I've been urging my constituents at home, here's something you can do, call your senators and urge that they pass the whatever comes from the committee, but hopefully the, the House, closer to the House version that has important elements in it that are um, key to our district, for example, so, such as the, some of the uh, forestry pieces that are in there that came from a bill my colleague has that I'm co-sponsoring as well. Forestry is very important, obviously, because right now my district is burning down. We've lost the town of Paradise. We had the car fire in my district about four months ago in Reading, so, you know, the, the remedy for the success fuel is fuel management. And that's where your members and our constituents can come in too. Grazing is a very important fire management tool as well as the economic plus it is for our industry here and for our constituents. So, um, and you know, it's, it's funny because I see uh, recent articles that say like grazing being experimented with as a fire tool, like, well, Really? Wow, 2018, you're figuring that out? We've been telling you this whole time. Your whole industry can recognize that. You can, you can see pictures on uh, Facebook and others where there's been a fire, burns right up to the fence line where people are grazing that, and the fire stops. Shazam. Yeah, obviously very important. Another important provision in the Farm Bill is the foot and mouth disease vaccine bank provision. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the importance of including that in the Farm Bill? Well, again, right now we have an opportunity with the Farm Bill to be on time, uh, the disease prevention in the industry is extremely important and so keeping it in the farm bill will be one of the many priorities we have and, and uh, it's been done in the past. There's no reason this should be a difficult climb right now. Great. Uh, California is a state that sends a lot of cattle to the Midwest. The electronic logging device and hours of service for livestock haulers has got to be a concern for, for California producers. Can you talk a little bit about where we stand on that issue? We've worked for a long time to get more flexibility for, for truckers and the hours, and we, we get that it's important to prevent uh, too much fatigue for the drivers, but we need to have the flexibility, especially when you're dealing with livestock, that the amount of on-duty hours uh, and driving hours, that it be flexible enough for them to get to uh, a particular station on time uh, with with the livestock. So it, it's it's a deal where... We're trying hard, and 
I don't know. It's kind of a thing where it's so political and so tied to uh, certain interests instead of just the common sense that uh, we need. We see that uh, in California where we fought through with these regulations as, as a state legislator, it's been so frustrating to say, why don't you allow the truckers and the people that they work for to set their own flexibility on hours within reasonable limits for you know, fatigue and safety and such, but flexibility is something that's needed much more. And I think uh, some of the interests in trucking will say, no, no, it's got to be very uh, uh, you know, regimented and that's dangerous to the livestock because they need to get to the next possible station there where they can be unloaded and watered and all the proper things that are needed to have a successful and safe uh, transport of this valuable commodity. Uh, you mentioned the devastating wildfires and our thoughts and prayers are certainly with all those affected. Um, it's just it, the loss of, of land and life and livestock is just is horrible. Um, for those that are affected by the wildfires, are there resources available to them to help as they deal with the aftermath? And are viewers who may want to help those affected, are there places that they can go? Yeah, thank you. Certainly the White House has been very cooperative with uh, coming forward with the disaster declarations for uh, getting FEMA resources moving. And so we had the major declaration was done within about 24 hours of the governor's ask here the other day for the one in Paradise. Again, we've had that, we had the Car Fire, we had the Hers Fire, we had the Delta Fire, we had the Ranch Fire. I mean, California is a tinderbox, and the Western states are. And so fuel management needs to be the long-term goal on this, true aggressive fuel management. But uh, indeed, the, the White House has responded, and so many people are responding too with uh, sending donations. I think at this point, they're, they're overwhelmed with physical items, so now it's coming down to uh, monetary help allows those that are uh, running the, the, the shelters and operating the uh, emergency systems there. Dollars are the most convertible thing to what they exactly need at the, at the, at the time for you know, whatever there might be a shortage of at that point. Because we're talking 30,000 people have been displaced or so. So you know, government has responded and but more importantly the people of Northern California and the U.S. have responded and with their prayers and with their their offerings of donations and such to uh, help people recover so it's pretty it's pretty amazing but you know longer term we have to do our job and set policy that um, helps with fuel management whether it's forestry itself or grasslands or brush or all these things that make it a tinderbox we need much more in buffer zones and uh, fire breaks and wise forest management that actually makes the forest healthier. Overcrowded forests create their own drought and the cattlemen, cattlewomen, the industry is a very important tool to help with that, with its grazing, with uh, the ability to uh, manage these fuels. It's a big plus. I don't know why that isn't embraced. Why is it a novel concept in the year 2018? Like, oh, we should get more grazing in and experiment with that. Like, I don't get it around here sometimes, but uh, we'll, we'll keep go going forward and push the novel concept. So. Yeah, anything to help prevent a loss like that in the future. And I know our viewers join, join me in, in offering prayers and support to all those affected. Thank you. And so I appreciate their patience too, because this ELD thing, as we were talking about, is not a one size fits all. The larger companies can do it, but you know, mom and pop truckers, um, you know, individuals, they don't need this mandate. And with the uniqueness of livestock hauling, uh, we're going to keep fighting on that. So, you know, we're, we're here trying to accomplish flexibility in these mandates. Yeah. Well, you have a task ahead of you, but we certainly appreciate the support that you've given the beef industry over the years, and we appreciate your time today, Congressman. Well, I, I appreciate them, too, and appreciate their support, and I appreciate being able to go to cattlemen's dinners and have the beef option instead of just rubber chicken or something. So, <laughs> Beef is definitely better. <laughs> it's what's for dinner. <laughs> yes, thank you again, okay, Congressman. Thank you. thank you very much. All right. Kevin, we'll send it back to you. Thanks, Kate. We'll check in with you again later in the show. Also ahead on this edition of NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen, we'll have more on what's happening here in Washington, D.C. and how federal policies and regulations may affect the cattle business. Stay with us. We'll be back right after this. When it comes to the beef business, there's no room for gray area. The decisions being made in Washington affect the future of the beef industry, the livelihood of your fellow farmers and ranchers. Your National Cattlemen's Beef Association knows there's what benefits cattlemen and there's what doesn't. To us, it's as clear as black and white. Visit joinncba.org to learn more. 
Let's go to New Orleans. That's where the Cattle Industry Convention and NCBA Trade Show will be in 2019. It's the cattle industry's biggest convention for the first time ever in New Orleans, a city filled with great fun, great food, and an amazing history. You can't miss it, so make plans now to go to the 2019 Cattle Industry Convention and NCBA Trade Show in New Orleans, January 30th through February 1st. Visit ncba.org for more. Welcome back. We're coming to you from Washington, D.C. as we dig into some of the tough policy issues facing the cattle industry. And joining us now to talk more about NCBA's efforts to protect cattlemen and women is Ellison Rivera, NCBA's Executive Director of Government Affairs. Allison, thank you so much for coming to the show. Happy to be here. So let's talk midterm elections. How are the results of the midterm elections going to impact the work you and the NCBA team does? Sure. So obviously there's going to be a new set of members coming into town. And so my team, the first thing we're going to do is get into those offices and um, become fast friends with those staff and those members of Congress and make sure that they know what the priorities are for our, our members. And so getting in there early and letting them know what's important to, uh, to our producers producers is going to be our first job. Now one topic of concern we've talked about before is cattle transportation. Why does this continue to be such an important topic? It's an important topic because we have to get our cattle where they need to go safely. Uh, right now we're sitting on an ELD delay and we're grateful for that, but we are continuing to work on the bigger issue at hand, which is hours of service. At the end of the day, the biggest issue is getting those animals safely where they need to go and we continue to send that message over to our friends at DOT. Fantastic. And if there's one thing you'd like to producers to know about some of the behind the scenes work and the value of the behind the scenes work that goes on here in DC, what would that be? Um, I would say that a lot of the work that we do, our members never know anything about. Uh, the conversations that we have with the agencies, with the members of Congress that we have the pleasure of working with day in and day out, a lot of the work gets done behind the scenes to where we don't have to worry or bother our producers. We get the job done and then the best part is we get to give them the good news of that win that we get to deliver to them. Some producers may wonder why NCBA needs to have two offices, one here in D.C. and one in Denver. What's the value of having an office right here in D.C.? So nine times out of ten when I speak to a rancher and I say, have you ever been to D.C.? And some have and some haven't. But honestly, a lot of them don't love the idea of coming to D.C. And they <laughs> thank us for being willing to live here and work here and, and do the work for them. And so I think our team is grateful to be able to work here for our producers and to take care of the nitty gritty stuff here while they're taking care of the most important thing, which is taking care of their cattle uh, in, in their homes. And so we are more than happy to be here in D.C. to do the work on their behalf to get those wins for them. And Allison, what can producers do to help support your efforts here in, in our nation's capital? I, as a former Hill staffer, I always tell people it's so important that, that people are calling their members of Congress, especially with this new batch of, of members coming in in January. Mm -hmm. You have to reach out to those members and let your voice be heard. If they don't hear from you, they sometimes don't know that there's an issue. You have to call, you have to email, you have to send snail mail and, and light up those phones and let them know that you're concerned. And then also just reaching out to our office in D.C. and letting us know what you're concerns are so that we can can help you and do that job. BeefUSA.org is a great place to go mm -hmm. for helpful information about the priorities that we're working on to fight for our members. Very good. Thank you so much for all your efforts and for coming on our show. Happy to be here. Thank you for having me. Now, if you'd like to support the beef industry, why not become an NCBA member? By doing so, you'll be sustaining the work of NCBA in defending and advocating for the cattle industry in Washington, D.C., it's easy to do. Just call 1-866-233-3872 or you can visit the website joinncba.org. Turning to international trade, demand for U.S. beef remains strong. In fact, this year's exports are running well ahead of last year's pace. According to data released by USDA and compiled by the U.S. Meat Export Federation, September beef exports totaled more than 110,000 metric tons, up 6% from a year ago. While export value topped $687 million, which is an 11% increase. For January through September, beef exports are up 9% from 2017, while value has increased 18% from the same time period last year. 
And joining us now is Kent Backus, NCBA's Director of International Trade and Market Access. Kent, thanks for coming today. Good to see you. You know, those really are some impressive export numbers. What's driving demand and do you believe we can continue this momentum? We've been very fortunate because there's been some tight supplies when you look at global beef. And given the growth in demand globally, that's, that's really made us very competitive. Part of that's driven by the ongoing drought they've had in Australia. Australia is a, a leading competitor with us in many of our export markets. Mm -hmm. So when you look at the drought that they're facing and the fact that that just makes us more competitive, especially in markets like Japan and Korea, it's been very beneficial for us, especially with Japan. Japan's our leading export market. Uh, just through September, we've sold about $1.6 billion worth of, of U.S. beef to Japanese consumers. And then right next to Japan, you have Korea. Korea has been a stellar market for us this year. We've seen a 50% increase in our sales, $1.3 billion just through September. Some of that is due also to those tight supplies, but also because we're enjoying an 8% tariff rate advantage over the Australians in the Korean market. That is solely attributed to the Korea Free Trade Agreement. So I think it's a combination of good economic winds blowing in our direction, but also good trade policy that's helped us capitalize on it. So beyond the markets you mentioned, are there other untapped markets that may provide some long-term opportunities for U.S. beef? I think uh, you know, we, we can't ignore the opportunities in Indonesia. It's uh, the largest halal market in the world. Uh, but also, we have to address the restrictions we face in the European Union. Uh, Europe is a, it, it has the potential to be a great market for us, but we continue to face non-science-based restrictions there. Uh, so when you look at the future opportunities, we would hope to be able to address that under the Trump administration. But also, you have to look at the United Kingdom and what may happen there in a post-Brexit world. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of opportunities that are out there, but the one that truly matters the most to us in the long run is China. Now, obviously, the current trade situation there, it restricts our ability to meet that demand. But when you look at uh, what our other competitors are doing in that market, it's amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, India, Brazil, Australia, they're sending record numbers of beef not only in volume, but in value to the Chinese market. We need to be part of that. That's really part of our future, and we're hopeful to see uh, these trade issues resolved in the very near future so that we can start to compete for those consumers. I would concur. So tell our viewers, what exactly is NCBA's role in fostering uh, these trade opportunities? Well, NCBA works directly with our government, uh, both the U.S. Trade Representative's Office and USDA, to help facilitate those conversations. We provide not only technical expertise, but also uh, we help tell that story. We help tell the story of how these trade policies impact our producers on the ground. So we're really that connection between government and industry. Uh, we not only work with our government agencies, we also work with Congress. So you've got to think about that. There are 535 opinions on Capitol Hill. We need to make sure that our story is told in a way that, that resonates with, their, with the constituents in each one of those districts. So uh, that's why we have a presence here in Washington, and that's why trade is such a priority for NCBA. It is a priority, and as we talk about uh, fair and free trade, why is that so critical to the future of the beef cattle industry? When you look at our industry, I mean, we rely on competition. We're not subsidized. We don't want to be. Uh, the only thing we want our government to do is to open markets and then get out of the way and let us do what we do best, and that's provide consumers with the product that they want. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's important that, that our people continue to engage and be involved in NCBA because we have to be the ones to take that message forward. You look at our population in, in the United States, it's becoming less rural and more urban. So not only do we have to improve our message to our urban constituents mm -hmm. and our urban customers, we have to look outside of our borders where 96% of the world's population is. That's where our future and our growth is. So it's important that people remain part of NCBA and that those who have either let their memberships lapse or who have never joined, consider coming back mm -hmm. because there's strength in numbers and our voice is strong and they need to be part of that. I couldn't agree more. Thanks so much for coming to our show, Kent. Thank you. Good to see you. Still ahead on this edition of NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen, we'll dig deeper into the work NCBA does in Washington to protect cattle producing families. Stay with us, we'll be right back. When it comes to the beef business, there's no room for gray area. The decisions being made in Washington affect the future of the beef industry, the livelihood of your fellow farmers and ranchers. 
Your National Cattlemen's Beef Association knows there's what benefits cattlemen and there's what doesn't. To us, it's as clear as black and white. Visit joinncba.org to learn more. Welcome back. NCBA is proud to be an organization of cattlemen and women working together to provide strength, support, and expertise in overcoming the many challenges that face all of us as beef producers. Joining me now to discuss this grassroots effort is Don Schievelbein, Policy Division Vice Chair. Don, thanks for coming to Washington, D.C. and being on our show. Glad to be with you today. So some people may not recognize that really the, the membership and the leadership of our organization is made up of beef cattle producers just like yourself. Tell folks a little bit about your background. Well, we are as much of a farmer as anybody can be, I guess. We're a large family operation from central Minnesota where we raise uh, seed stock cattle, farm, and actually feed out a bunch of our customers' cattle there as well. And if that isn't enough, we also own an interest in a sale barn in South Dakota. So we stay busy with that family. I would say so. And what got you involved in NCBA? Why did you engage in this organization? Well, my dad's been a lifelong member. And I guess uh, kind of true to him, I guess, I became a NCBA member the same time I graduated college. Mm -hmm. So when I got my degree, I also got my membership card. But it kind of got a little more detailed when I went moved back to Minnesota when Jerry Wolf contacted me and said, you know what, you need to get more engaged here and you need to do your part to for this beef industry. And I obliged and the rest is history. You know, you talk about serving the organization and, and it's been my sense, uh, Don, that some people more our age are less apt to get involved in terms of serving in leadership positions, not just within this organization, but many others. Why is it so important as the issues get more critical to, to, to engage and, and, and to get this volunteer, uh, these volunteer leaders engaged? Well, it's just strictly a numbers game, Kevin. If you look at uh, agriculture being 2% of the population, we need all hands on deck. We need everybody engaged. And it doesn't necessarily have to be a formal engagement, whether you're an officer of your local state organization, or if you're doing like my daughter Bailey's doing, where she does uh, ag in the classroom mm. each week and puts a little video together and sells the message to everybody at how good agriculture is and the positive things our industry does. So I think it's all hands on deck, everybody get engaged. Because what we do know for certain is there are those who want to put us out of business. Mm -hmm. And if we aren't constantly staying vigilant about that task, I think uh, the future won't be as bright as it can be. You know, we, we define NCBA as a grassroots organization. Tell folks why we refer to NCBA as a grassroots organization and specifically how policy is set. Well, yeah, you know, what was interesting when I was uh, elected an officer, several people came up to me and say, okay, what agenda items do you have? And of course, as you know, Kevin, that's contrary to NCBA. The way agenda items and policy gets developed is cattle producers and ranchers out there decide there's an issue that's important or, or dear to their heart. They bring it up through the process through the state cattlemen's organization. They develop that policy, fine tune that policy, and it eventually comes to the national organization. And the task of us officers basically is to carry out the wishes of the membership. So we are the ones who say, these are the policies the membership have established. Now it's our job to give the marching orders to make sure they get done. You execute the decisions and the policy priorities of the rest of the membership. It's as simple as that. That's fantastic. So what would you say our organization and industry has to do to make certain that the beef cattle industry is a viable industry for many years to come? Really, and that's that engagement. It needs to have complete engagement. And you know, our story is so positive that we need to have more and more people telling that story. Again, as people lose touch generationally on what agriculture is about, mm -hmm. 
it's incumbent upon us to tell this story, make sure when they see somebody wearing a cowboy hat like me, it's not a John Wayne movie, it's more of a way of life and that way of life still permeates the world today. You don't see many of those hats here in DC, do you? No, you don't. In <laughs> fact, I could have sold the hat many times. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, we appreciate you coming to the show and thank you for the leadership you're providing. Thank you. To keep up to date on the issues facing cattlemen and women and to help make a difference in the industry, why not join Don as a member of NCBA? Just call 1-866-233-3872. Or you can visit the website joinncba.org. Still to come, we'll have a closer look at how NCBA helps beef producers deal with troublesome federal regulations. Stay with us. There's more of this special edition of Cattlemen to Cattlemen just ahead. At Case IH, we believe it's our job to provide you with solutions. That's why our Farmall and Maxim tractors, as well as our tools and attachments, are designed with you in mind. From mowing to baling to loading and more, we're here to help turn your to-dos into to-dones. At Case IH, we'll keep your days running smoothly with equipment that's durable, versatile, and highly efficient. No wonder farmers are more loyal to Case IH than any other brand. Visit your local dealer or go to caseih.com forward slash livestock for more. Hey folks, I'm Bobby Hebert of Cajun Cannons from the New Orleans Saints. Come on down to the Big Easy for the 2019 Cattle Industry Convention and NCBA Trade Show. It'll be the biggest and the best you've ever seen. There'll be great food, fun, and outstanding music from country music duo Big and Rich. So join me and let's go to New Orleans January the 30th to February the 1st. Find out more at BeefUSA.org. Welcome back to this special edition of Cattlemen to Cattlemen as we come to you from our nation's capital. We're learning more about the work NCBA does right here in Washington and how it protects the freedom to operate for cattle producing families all across our country. Now joining us, Mary Thomas Hart. She's the NCBA Deputy Environmental Counsel. Mary Thomas, thanks for coming to the show. Thanks for having me. You know, the waters of the United States is a rule that just simply doesn't seem to want to go away. Uh, can you give us an update on where we stand with this? Well, Kevin, I think we both know that the speed of the federal government is about as fast as molasses, but <laughs> getting the federal waters of the United States rule to go away is proving especially tough. Um, just as a refresher, in February 2017, President Trump issued an executive order directing the EPA to rescind and replace the 2015 WOTUS rule. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of people thought that that executive order was it, that WOTUS was done. Um, but I like to think of it as more of the starting pistol for a marathon. <laughs> um, it's an important step, but on its own doesn't have a lot of impact. Mm -hmm. So that action, that executive order, really put in effect EPA's regulatory process. So we're in the middle of that process now. NCBA is engaging in that process, and we fully expect EPA to finalize rescission of the 2015 WOTUS rule in spring 2019. Now remind us specifically of the risks that the WOTUS rule would bring to cattle producing families. The 2015 rule would have been extremely problematic for cattle producers. It was a gross overreach by the federal government in an attempt to regulate ditches and other dry features on private property. In fact, Three federal courts across the country have already ruled that it's likely illegal. So we're really happy to see it go. So if the first step is for EPA to actually rescind the rule, then what happens next? Well, I think that it's important to note that the term or the phrase waters of the United States isn't something that the EPA came up with it with. That's a term that's in statute that's in the Clean Water Act. And in 2006, the Supreme Court directed the EPA to define waters of the United States. The 2015 rule is the product of that direction, albeit a bad product, <laughs> but when the 2015 rule is gone, there's still gonna be a requirement from the Supreme Court to define WOTUS. Mm. And we look forward to that because 
the term waters of the United States is pretty vague. Mm -hmm. And without some parameters around that term, EPA basically has a blank check. Sure. So when we look to defining waters of the United States, NCBA and cattle producers really need two things, clean water and clear rules. <laughs> clean water is necessary to keep our families safe mm -hmm. and our cattle safe. Mm -hmm but without clear rules, our businesses won't survive. Mm -hmm. And I really do think that Congress intended that there be a balance between clean water and clear rules. And that balance comes when states have the ability and the power and the authority to work with stakeholders and effectively implement water quality standards. I love it, clean water and clear rules. Yes. That's one to remember. Yep. Now, a couple of other laws that could impact producers, as I understand, are CERCLA and EPCRA. Can you tell our viewers what those laws are and how they might impact us? Yeah, this is just an example of a bad case decision leading to a bad standard. Mm -hmm. In April 2017, the D.C. Circuit Court subjected nearly 200,000 livestock producers to ammonia and hydrogen sulfide reporting requirements under CERCLA and EPCRA. Mm -hmm. Now, under CERCLA, reports are filed with the EPA and Coast Guard, and under EPCRA, reports are filed with state and local emergency responders. And I think it's important to remember that these aren't highly concentrated releases, like an anhydrous ammonia gas tank. These are diffuse, emissions from manure. <laughs> so really Amazing. odor emissions. Wow. Um, and it's ridiculous. Luckily, Congress also thought it was ridiculous. So a bipartisan Congress passed legislation in both the House and the Senate. That legislation was entitled the Farm Act, not to be confused with the Farm Bill. Um, that legislation was passed in the spring and signed into law by the president. Mm. So luckily, Livestock producers are exempt from reporting requirements under CERCLA. And EPA is currently going through a regulatory process to exempt livestock producers from reporting requirements under EPCRA. So more to come on that front, but we're really excited. Wow, that is true government overreach, and I'm so glad we have people like you here in D.C. watching out for our interests. Thanks for doing that. Thanks for coming to the show. Thank you. As cattlemen and women know all too well, Congress isn't the only place in Washington that can have an impact on our business. From EPA to USDA, federal regulation can hit the beef cattle industry as well. To join NCBA in the fight against regulatory overreach, call 1-866-233-3872 or visit the website joinncba.org. Still ahead, we'll discuss some of the many benefits of becoming a member of NCBA. And we'll also visit with the cowboy poet Baxter Black. Stay with us. We'll be right back. When the field is your office, you never get tired of going to work. Cut, break, bail, repeat. New Holland offers the power and versatility to get through the day. From small squares to large squares and everything in between, New Holland has you covered. Visit your local dealer today to find out more. New Holland, equipped for a new world. The 2019 Cattle Industry Convention and NCBA Trade Show is set for the Big Easy, New Orleans, Louisiana. It's the cattle industry's biggest convention with education, networking, and fun. Plus, you can check out the huge NCBA Trade Show, outstanding entertainment, and much more. So let's go to New Orleans for the 2019 Cattle Industry Convention and NCBA Trade Show, January 30th through February 1st. Details at ncba.org. Welcome back. We're coming to you from Washington, D.C. as we dig into some of the tough policy issues facing the cattle industry. Let's toss it back to Kate Maher on Capitol Hill for more. Kate? Thanks, Kevin. We're here now with Congressman Roger Marshall from Kansas. And Congressman, first of all, thank you for your time and visiting with us today. Glad to be here. Glad to talk. Excellent. Now, in addition to your duties here on Capitol Hill, you're an OBGYN, and I understand you've even fed cattle before. Can you give us a little background in the industry growing up? You know, so I grew up working on our family farms. My first real job was at a cell barn. 
Uh, so it just grew up around the industry. You can't live in Great Bend, Kansas without getting more involved with agriculture. So some of my uh, friends invited me to, to get in with them on feeding some cattle. So I learned some really valuable lessons. I learned that you can lose money in the cattle industry. Yeah, I think a lot of our feeders would probably concur with you on that. Uh, speaking of Great Bend, I understand that you took your staff out there for a staff retreat in a dairy and feedlot operation. Why was that something that was important to you to get your staff out of D.C. and into a setting like that? Yeah, most of my staff has a Kansas connection, but 60% of the economy in, in my district is related to agriculture. So I think as you're developing policy, it's good to know who the people are, what's behind the scenes. You know, immigration comes to mind. We have 70,000 jobs in Kansas that are dependent upon an agriculture guest worker visa. So putting names with faces with some of these people is just is so very important. I, and I think just if you get to know your, your clients, your customers, which to me are the constituents of Kansas, then, then you work harder and you work smarter. Absolutely. As a big, as a big feeding state, uh, getting cattle to Kansas, you get cattle from all over the country, getting them there safely is important. You signed on to a letter of support to, to talk about um, in support of NCBA's efforts for the electronic logging device and hours of service. Where do we stand on that and why is that important to Kansas producers? Well, as you know, we have cattle that come from all over the country. I have a congressman from Florida, from California, from Wyoming, and Montana, and their cattle come to Kansas to, to graze and to be fed as well. So it's very important. Uh, we know that it was unrealistic to, that we could ship animals and take a 27-hour frame where people are hopping on, hopping off of, of, these, uh, of, of, the, of the big the big semis that bring them, those same cattle trucks that I used to load, load. So we know it's a big stress on the animals as you load them and un unload them. Uh, so we need to be able to help our, our current feeders out as well and get those cattle here more efficiently, more safely. And I know we have an exemption on that. What are, you hope, what are your hopes for this issue in the lame duck session? Well, we're going to keep pushing forward on a farm, on somehow on the farm bill to make that a more of a permanent situation. And if we don't get it done now, we'll keep working on it next year. You talk about your constituents. Why is it important for people back in Kansas or even across the country to get involved with a group like NCBA to make sure their voices are heard here on Capitol Hill where, where maybe agriculture isn't always top of mind? I think you said it best, that, that the NCBA is the voice of, of, the, of the cattle industry in so many ways up here. Uh, you know, I grew up working on a small little ranch, small little farms, and you just couldn't possibly have a loud voice if we're all speaking in different directions. So NCBA gives us one voice, has relationships with congressmen since myself. You know, even, even before I was elected, uh, we're having great relationships, going back even to the Kansas Livestock Association, a relationship with them as well. So to me, there I can't have uh, thousands of voices talking to me. I need one central message, and I need solutions. So when we had the electronic logging device, the Kansas Livestock Association and the NCBA both helped us develop the policy that would work and will work in the future. Well, we certainly as NCBA appreciate your support of the beef industry on that issue and so many others. And Dr. Marshall, we really appreciate your time today. Thank, Thank you very much. Absolutely. Glad to be here. Kevin, we'll send it back to you. Thanks, Kate. When we return, it's time for another visit with our good friend Baxter Black. Stay with us. We'll be right back. No matter what job I've got to do, my John Deere 5E tractor can do it all. Whether I'm cutting, moving feed, or building a fence. Using my 5E means my work gets done faster at a price I can afford, and that works for me. Did you know that Prefert makes over a thousand different farm, ranch, and rodeo items? And now, thanks to Prefert Direct, it's easier than ever before to get access to every item Prefert makes delivered direct to your local dealer. For more information about Prefert Direct, visit us at Prefert.com. Prefert, America's number one name in farm, ranch, and rodeo. When a new calf hits the ground, his clock starts ticking. A belly full of colostrum gives him his best odds, but if he doesn't get any, his time starts running out. That's when you grab a bag of Oxford Ag Colostrum in their patented feeding system. Fill them with warm water, shake it to mix, feed it with a tube or nipple, and you are done. No bucket, no bottle, no mess, and right on time. Get yours at OxfordAg.com. Cost less than a dead calf.
Their pictures are painted on ancient of caves. Orion has held them on high, revered through the ages with instinct so deep it appears in a young child's eyes. Since time beyond time, they have sat round the fire in the evening, reliving the chase, offering prayers to the heavens above for the swiftness, the big heart and grace of creatures who challenge their strength and their will to be worthy and up to the task. But often they fail because nature is fair, but they try, that's all they can ask. And there around the campfire, small doubts tweak their mind as they stare at the smoke and the glow to summon the courage patience and skill for crosswinds beyond their control. And though novice or blooded, each hopes to himself that luck will ride with him at dawn, because a second or step in time or in space is the difference between get or gone. These primitive thoughts have clouded their minds since man started stalking the earth. The lore is passed down and is part of their soul, and they have heard these same songs since their birth. It hums through their veins. But everyone dreams, and it's what brings them here under the stars. That prime evil force they could never explain, as deep as the craters on Mars. And as the campfire light dances, and the flame still entrances these warriors tradition imbues. By the glow of the embers, the teller remembers the big one that got away blue. This is Baxter Black from out there. Thanks, Baxter. We sure enjoy our visits with you each and every week. Want to rewatch an episode of Cattleman to Cattleman or catch up on anything you've missed? Then visit our YouTube page. You'll find replays of all of our shows filled with educational segments and producer profiles from around the country. So check us out at youtube.com slash Cattleman to Cattleman. There's more Cattleman to Cattleman still ahead, so stay with us. At Case IH, we believe it's our job to provide you with solutions. That's why our Farmall and Maxim tractors, as well as our tools and attachments, are designed with you in mind. From mowing to baling to loading and more, we're here to help turn your to-dos into to-dones. At Case IH, we'll keep your days running smoothly with equipment that's durable, versatile, and highly efficient. No wonder farmers are more loyal to Case IH than any other brand. Visit your local dealer or go to caseih.com forward slash livestock for more. If you're connected with the beef cattle business, then you should like the NCBA page on Facebook. The NCBA Facebook page shares photos, news, and valuable information about the beef cattle industry. You can also follow the NCBA Twitter feed at BeefUSA. So stay in touch with NCBA on Facebook and Twitter. Welcome back. NCBA works every day to increase profit opportunities for cattle producers, but the organization's success depends upon a strong membership base. And here to tell us more about the value of joining NCBA is John Robinson. He's NCBA's Vice President of Membership and Communications. John, thanks for coming to, D to DC. Thanks for having me, Kevin. So why is it so important, and specifically, what's the value that we as producers get from having an office here in Washington, DC? Well, I think there's a couple of things, Kevin, and I get this question a lot when I'm out in the country. Uh, the first thing really is the understanding of the issues. They're complex. Uh, if you're not involved in it every day, uh, it's something you're automatically behind. And the other thing is the relationships that our staff develops. Uh, you know, a lot of them have experience on the Hill. A lot of them have national political experience. Uh, you only get that here in D.C., and that's why it's important for our producers. And what sets NCBA's office apart from other industry organizations that are based here in D.C.? Well, we, ha we have a full-time professional staff here. We have uh, about 20 people here in the Washington, D.C. office. Uh, they work cattle industry issues every single day, only cattle industry issues. We're the only organization representing cattle producers anywhere in the country that has that experience and, and that expertise. 
And, and why is it important for all beef cattle producers to, to be members of the National Cattlemen's Beef Association? You know, we really need uh, as many voices as possible. When our staff goes to Capitol Hill, uh, they ask how many producers we represent, uh, how big is your footprint, what's your voice. Uh, we represent more than 25,000 direct members and, and as a result of our state affiliate members, uh, we have uh, probably close to 200,000 uh, members that are uh, a part and parcel of NCBA and that's really important. Uh, they know that we represent the bulk of the industry uh, and so when we go to these offices and, and they ask who do you speak for, that's who we speak for and that's important here. You mentioned the state affiliates. Why is it important for vo those folks watching tonight to be members of both the state organizations as well as the National Cattlemen's Beef Association. You bet, Kevin. Uh, really, NCBA policy starts at the grassroots level. Uh, all of our policies come from the, the state affiliates that bring those forward from their local chapters. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the importance of being a state member is really felt at the state level. Uh, those were the issues at the state houses, state legislatures uh, really impact producers. It's where they really have an opportunity to make a difference uh, uh, at the local level. But at the national level, those issues are, are much bigger than any one state. They span, you know, for instance, the Endangered Species Act across multiple states. And, and we really need producers to be a member of both organizations so that both are strong, both are able to represent the interests of producers. I couldn't agree more. Thanks for coming. You bet, Kevin. Thanks for having me. Don't forget, registration and housing for the 2019 Cattle Industry Convention and NCBA Trade Show is now open. The convention will be held in New Orleans, Louisiana from January 30th through February 1st. To find out all the details, including how to register online, just visit ncba.org. Well, that wraps up this special edition of NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. Thanks so much for spending time with us. We'll see you again next week right here on RFD TV.